to St. Luke, the 23rd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with two criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and people stood by watching. But the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since we are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. The gospel of our Lord.
The kingdom of God broke into this world through Jesus Christ and brought a different order of life. The broken, the hungry, the poor were released from their guilt. And it became the responsibility of those who were blessed to be fair, to live with justice and righteousness. This radical kingdom of God was brought to earth by Jesus Christ, and it is now carried through with the body of Christ. That is the church, you and I and all of God's children. Paul reminds us in his letter to Colossians, that was our second reading, he says, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he would be preeminent. Jesus Christ is the visible part of the body of God, manifested through the church. Luke 17, 20 says, Do not say, look, it is here, or look, it is there, because the kingdom of God is within you and among you. Or as Matthew 16, 16 lifts up, Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Good for you, Simon, son of John, Jesus responds, for this truth did not come to you from any human being, but was given to you directly from my Father in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, you are a rock. On this rock, I will build my church, and not even death will overcome it. The visible part of the kingdom of God is seen through the church, not the walls, not the pews, not the stained glass window or the furnishings, but the people. You and I and all of God's children working together. God's people, doing God's mission, being God's hands and feet, eyes and ears, voices, minds, and hearts. As, King, as Psalm 95 reminds us this morning, as the kingdom of God, we are gathered here in God's house to worship. As the psalm says, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy. Let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker. As the body of Christ, we are called and empowered to worship, to praise, to bow down and bend the knee in honor and reverence of our King of Kings. Worship is a duty. It is a right, and it is a privilege for each of us. However, some people think it's useless. Why worship? Why sing praises? Why do the practices of the old church? Because we are commanded to. It is our duty. It is our response for all that the King of Kings does for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Worship is a way, an opportunity for us to love God and love neighbor. It is an opportunity for us to be nourished and fed by God's word in the sacraments, in community. To be fed and nourished. To be able to be the church in this world. Think about it like this. In a village in York several centuries ago, a nobleman wondered what legacy he would leave for the townspeople. So he decided he would build them a church as his legacy. The completed plans were kept secret. When the people gathered, they marveled at this beautiful church with all its beauty and completeness. He hadn't left anything out. Following so many compliments of praise, one astute observer inquired, but where are the lamps? How will this church be lit? Without answering, the nobleman pointed to the brackets all along the walls. Then he gave each family a lamp to be carried to worship services each week and to be hung on the walls. He said to them, each time you are here, in your seats, gathered together, the area where you sit will be lighted. Each time you are not here, that area will be dark. Whenever you fail to come to church, whenever you fail to gather with us, some of God's house will be dark. Think about that image. We gather here on Sunday to be fed and nourished, but we don't gather as spectators or as guests. We gather here as participants, feeding and nourishing 
loving one another, singing praises with one another, praying with one another, sharing God's love with one another. When one of us aren't here, there is darkness in that place when we don't bring that love. That brings us to our gospel lesson this morning. And we may think our reading this morning seemed out of place as we celebrate Christ the King and hear about his death. But we would be wrong. What better way to truly see the radical nature of Christ's kingship than the cross? What better way to see the suffering nature of our King? What better way to see truly the radical nature of the gospel than through the cross? The cross is the ultimate symbol of Christ, our King. On the cross, in his conversation with that second criminal, we see the kingdom of God in action. We see the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, bringing the good news to that man in all of its splendor and wonder. There are three very powerful illustrations lifted up in our gospel lesson, especially for that second criminal. For this first thing, Jesus was declaring him not guilty when he repented of his sins. Also, Jesus was right there suffering with him. So Jesus also knew and was a victim. And finally, through Christ, they both received victory. When the man said, we are indeed condemned justly, for we are receiving our, what we deserve, that was an act of repentance. He knew he had done wrong, and he repented. Then, because of his repentance, he saw Jesus Christ for who he truly was. And he asked the question, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom? He wanted to be a part of that kingdom. And how, how did Jesus answer? The words that we hope to hear, each of us hope to hear, when we breathe our final breath in this world. Truly, I say to you, this day, you will be with me in paradise. In answering the man, Jesus was relieving him of his guilt. As it says in Romans 4, 5, Whoever believes in God, who declares the guilty to be innocent, it is their faith that God takes into account in order to put them right with God. The kingdom of God causes us to examine ourselves. And then, true repentance can happen. Jesus is there to declare the person not guilty because Jesus paid the penalty for their wrongs. For his body broken and his blood shed on the cross. Notice that Jesus does and continues to do the work of forgiving, not us. Jesus declares it so by his work of salvation, not ours. The only thing we have to do is believe, or trust, or have faith. How easy is that to do some days? How many of us have had times in our lives when we think, God, how could you possibly love me at this point, much less forgive me? How many of us know people in our lives that we wonder how God could possibly love that person, much less forgive them for what they have done? But we are reminded today that our Lord of Lord and King of Kings makes sure that we are indeed loved, that they are indeed loved, that all repentant hearts are forgiven, not through our actions, but through the love of Jesus Christ. And not because we deserve it, but because we don't. That, my sisters and brothers in Christ, is love. That is grace. That is mercy.